الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد The title that I have been given to share with you about in these 15 minutes is Challenging the Existence of God Through Challenging the Prophethood of Muhammad Sallallahu um, Alaihi Wasallam Actually, I, I'd like to feed off of what our beloved Shaykh Mukhtar uh, elaborated so beautifully and kind of summarize it because I need that to feed off of and to actually discuss with you a few things that I have in mind on this topic. Essentially, in my personal experiences, this is not something based on books and research. It is both based entirely on anecdotal, personal experience. Uh, my own journey towards faith and friends and others that I've met along the way that have had conversations with me about trouble in believing in God and things like that. Uh, basically, atheism boils down to two issues where people of faith and people not of faith see things very differently, as far as I'm concerned. And I think one of them was almost completely dealt with uh, in, in Sheikh Mukhtar's talk, and that is the idea of how we view creation. The idea that a believer sees creation very differently. We're looking at the same sun, the same moon, the same earth, the same existence, the creation of our own selves, down to the same protein, but the conclusions we're reaching are very, very different. For an atheist, it is essentially chalked up to chance and order or, and chaos and has no purpose or conscience in and of itself. The entire universe is without conscience. And therefore, it is easy to extrapolate from that that human beings themselves don't possess a conscience. So the entire idea of right and wrong and morality, all of it can be washed away because it is entirely up to us to decide what is right and wrong, etc. Right? So a, a consequence of believing in you know, this, this chaos is actually it brings the chaos to human existence. In other words, we, we're not answerable to anyone, and we don't have to have any order in our lives, right? So it, there are consequences to this beyond just an academic exercise about the origins of the universe. They have direct impact on how we see our own lives. Okay, so that's fun. Just, just the first thing, how we view creation. And the second most common discussion, and there are obviously branches that come out of these discussions, but the second major one is essentially the matter of attributes of God. And if there is a God, how is he so unfair? And this thing boils down to, and I'm, I'm being, again, very unacademic as I explain this to you, it's either a personal matter or it's an observational matter. So in a, in, in a personal sense, it's if God is so awesome, how, did, how come I was diagnosed with cancer? How come I lost my job? What did my, my child ever do deserve to die? How come the tornado hit my house, not the next door house? Basically, matters of justice, God and his relationship with justice, right? How come this injustice happened to me? So it's a, some kind of a personal trauma, which was alluded to in the previous talk as psychological origins of atheism, right? There's a personal experience with some kind of, or some kind of bad experience, and you blame God for it. How come he didn't protect me from it? How come the, you know, he didn't come to my aid? I even prayed to him so many times, and I still failed, and I didn't get into medical school, etc., etc., and therefore I'm having a crisis of faith. That's on a personal side. On the, on the observational side is how come there is war? How come there's disease? How come there are you know, diseases that have no cure yet, or whatever? Or how come there are catastrophes where innocent people are dying? And all of this, look around you, where do you see justice? How can you believe in a God that lets all of these kinds of things happen? So on the one hand is how we view creation, how we observe the universe around us and obviously even ourselves. And on the other hand is matters of justice. Is matters of justice, whether they have to do with personal experience or it has to do with one's observations of the world. And that's basically, of, of all the conversations I may have had with people that are having trouble with faith, or just don't see it, or see, see people that believe as some kind of primitive pre-modern creature that doesn't belong in this century, when they have these conversations, it boils down to one of these two things. Essentially, it boils down to one of these two things. Now, my subject is not where atheism comes from, but rather one of the super, superficial criticisms of people of faith is actually not a conversation about God, or about the validity of an existence of God, or a God, or, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with perfect attributes, but rather a conversation about how silly it is to believe this thing people call revelation. How can you people believe that there's a man who God speaks to, and gives a message to, and this message is supposed to be absolutely followed, and this man had no scientific you know, exploits, and he was living in pre-modern times in the middle of a desert, or even those before him, 
you know, the other prophets that came before him. And they're supposed to have a message that's relevant to all of us, even though we're living in the age where discovery and information is now more evolved and more, you know, more expanded than ever before in human history. How is he supposed to know better what we, how we live our life? And he lived in a primitive desert where they didn't even have brick construction. How is he supposed to tell us? how to live our lives. You see, this, this is the kind of underlying premise of the questioning of revelation. The argument I'm trying to present to you is if someone's already having a problem with the ultimate authority, Allah Azza wa Jal, then having a problem with his ambassador to the earth and having a problem with his message sent to the earth and his messengers is only a secondary issue. That's only a secondary. And even if you resolve this issue, the underlying issue is a denial of Allah himself. That doesn't go away. So a lot of times, a young Muslim people, and I've seen this in my own experience when I was younger and a lot dumber, and I'm still walk, climbing out of the well of stupidity myself, but you know, I see a lot of young people still caught up in this thing and they're really fired, about, fired up about their da'wah and things like that, and an atheist comes or a, you know, a Daniel pipe come, Pipes comes, or some of the other writers come and they say, look, the Quran has contradictions, or it has this or that or the other, or you people believe this, you know, the Prophet Muhammad says this, uh, you know, they don't call him Prophet, they don't say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we do, right? And he says, this is found in Bukhari and this is found in Muslim. How do you explain this and how do you explain that? And we get so fired up and we need to answer all of those criticisms. And we, need, we feel the urge to say, no, 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 there's no contradiction here. There's nothing here. You're actually looking at it the wrong way. And they label all of our responses as, as apologetics. Okay, all of our responses are basically us Finding one way or the other to rationalize what is inherently flawed. That's how they view it. The problem with all of this is we're getting caught up in a game that is designed for us to lose. It's by design. The nature of this game is no matter what you come up with, la yu'minun. And it's not la yu'minun bir risala. It's not a matter of rejecting revelation. It's a matter of rejecting Allah Himself. Allah Himself. Now let's turn to the Quran for some guidelines on this. On atheism. On atheism. I'm, I'm, I would consider myself finally maybe a beginner student of Qur'an now after maybe 15 years of trying to understand this book. And I can tell you one thing with some level of confidence. Atheism is not a subject in the Qur'an. Atheism is not a subject in the Qur'an. Qur'an does discuss doubt. It absolutely does. It does discuss doubt. But it discusses doubt in revelation. It discusses doubt in messengers. It discusses doubt in the afterlife. All the things, all the aspects of our faith that stem from believing in Allah. The conclusions you're supposed to reach, if you truly do believe in God, there are some conclusions you're supposed to reach on your own, like this God would not have left me without guidance. This God cannot be unjust, there must be some mechanism of justice. All those conclusions people doubt and those are discussed. And when it comes to Allah and doubt, Allah just asks the rhetorical question as though it's not even a valid concern. Afillahi shak? Is there even doubt in Allah? And even that's not, ex it's not even afi wujudillahi shak. It's not even, is it in the existence of God there is doubt? But rather, afillahi shak can even be understood as, are you doubting his justice, his mercy, his love, his care, his guidance in what he's telling you? Are you doubting, doubting any attribute of his? Not his existence. His existence is not questioned in the Quran. And the answer to that that Shaykh Mukhtar referred to from Surah Al A'raf. Just hands it to us because it's a natural, you know, part of our being. It was instilled inside of us the belief in Allah. We have to work to exercise it out of our system. That's our view. Our view of ourselves and our view of the universe around us is fundamentally different. It's fundamentally different. Finally, I want to talk to you about the miracle of the Quran and the miracles given to previous prophets. And these conversations have been in our tradition for a very long time, and you've heard some version of this either in a halaqa or in a khutbah or at Sunday school before you passed out. But somehow or another, you've been exposed to the idea that the Quran is a miracle. What I'd like to share with you in what, how much time do I have before I get the parking light? What's the time? I'll just keep going? Okay. All right, I'm not gonna keep going. I just, I, I'd rather hear from you guys. But what I wanna share with you is, when it comes to the miracle of the Quran, what's usually done, is that it is the idea of the Qur'an being divine, right? Here's proof that it cannot be the product of the human mind. Here's conclusive evidence. It is usually presented from one dimension or another. Perhaps it's the scientific knowledge it contained. Perhaps it's, it's linguistic perfection. Perhaps it's, it's legal depth. You know, how comprehensively it covers 
issues like inheritance in such brief language. Perhaps it's brevity in speech. Perhaps it's its imagery. Perhaps it's its power on human beings, its psychological effects. Perhaps it's the impact it had on human history. What other document has had that kind of impact on human history? Perhaps it's its readership or the effects it has on a person individually. Perhaps it's its spiritual power. There are all of these different dimensions of what makes the Qur'an miraculous. The problem, however, is when we phrase it incorrectly. When you phrase it incorrectly, you're saying the Qur'an is a miracle because of these reasons. That, in my humble opinion, is phrasing it incorrectly. The Qur'an is miraculous in more ways than you and I can understand or perhaps even appreciate in a lifetime. But what I find, I'm phrasing it the way I think it should be phrased. What I find particularly miraculous about the Qur'an is, and then you fill it in. What I am left dumbfound with is this. What captures me more than anything else is this. You see, the miracle of the Qur'an experienced by Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he was listening to the ayat as a disbeliever, Hiding behind the veil of the Kaaba and listening to the ayat being recited by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that could pretty much even read his mind. He was thinking something in his mind. The Prophet doesn't know he's there. He's just reciting the, the words. He said, "This is a pretty beautiful recitation. This is good poetry." Well, shair. He hears not the word of a poet. And he didn't say it out loud, but the Quran is reciting, being recited, saying he's not. It's not the word of a poet. He goes, oh, I "Read my mind." It's not the word of a mind reader. Whoa, read that too. <laughs> if you were to ask him at that moment, what is the miracle of the Qur'an? He'd say these ayat. These are the miracle of the Qur'an. In other words, the miraculous power of the Qur'an is appreciated at an individual level. It is appreciated at an individual level. It is not one dimension or the other that is blasted across humanity and everybody will believe it or appreciate its power in the same way. It doesn't work that way. And the evidence of that I want to present to you from the Quranic perspective, and I'll sit down. You see, belief in Allah is a composite of two things to us. It's a spiritual reality and an intellectual reality, yes? The belief in Allah Azza wa Jal is on the one hand a spiritual truth. It is something that rests in the heart of the believer. But at the same time, it is something that we call to ala basira, with eyes open. There are fundamental, philosophical, rational, commonsensical evidences based on which we believe in Allah Azza wa Jalla, some of which very eloquently and very comprehensively you heard in the last talk. Okay, the same is true of the Qur'an. Reflection on the Qur'an and a complaint by Allah Azza wa Jalla that reflection is not happening as it should. Tadabbur is not happening as it should is iterated a couple of times in the Qur'an. And once it is mentioned as a spiritual problem, and the other time it is mentioned as an intellectual problem, it's incredible. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Allah complains about the lack of reflection on the Qur'an and questions whether is it the hearts that have their own locks placed on them. That's a long discussion. I'm not going to explain the ayah or discuss things from the ayah. But what I'm going to get to is, Allah argues in the ayah, He complains that people don't reflect on the Qur'an enough because there's a problem where? In the hearts. Yes? In the hearts. Another place in Qur'an, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا how come they don't have reflection on the Qur'an? And had it been from other than Allah, they would have found a lot of contradiction in it. Now, when you're looking for contradictions in a text, is that a spiritual exercise or an intellectual exercise? That's an intellectual exercise. The reflection on the Qur'an, on the one hand, Allah claims it doesn't happen because people, their hearts aren't in it. Their hearts are not in it. But if their heart was in it, and they were seriously looking into the Qur'an and reflecting, then they would discover that it absolutely has no criticism, no contradiction. The question about people who say, I've read the Quran and it's got a lot of contradictions. Okay, I've read your Quran. I live in Texas now, I can't help it. <laughs> I read the Quran, it's got a lot of contradictions. You've read it, but you haven't what? Reflected. You haven't reflected. And when you reflect, you will only discover that there is no Contradiction. But who is going to spend time reflecting on the Qur'an? Except someone who is deeply, genuinely from their heart looking for guidance. Otherwise you'll do a casual read, pick out the things you'd like to criticize and move on. Qur'an makes its miraculous nature clear to the one who gives it a fair chance. 
If you give it a fair chance, it'll make itself clear to you. So the argument you're having outside of your MSA room with the philosophy club guy, that argument will go on forever. It started when I was there in the MSA. It back when, when I could barely grow beard hair and I was discussing God with a guy across from the other room. And now it's another guy who's barely growing his beard here and he's arguing with another guy. And the arguments haven't actually changed. They haven't actually changed. The size of our cell phones have. But, you know, we're, 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 it's cyclical. We're, we're caught in this cycle. We have to understand there's something more. And that, that if we present the miraculous power of the Qur'an in a blanket way, the final issue with this is going to be it creates a problem. Like if I'm, for example, I'm a student of language. One of the thing that fa things that fascinates me about the Qur'an more than anything else is the incredible language of the Qur'an. It's just mind-boggling. How, in, how intricate the language of the Qur'an is as a student of language, as a student of linguistics, and then a student of Qur'an, you are left just dumbfound. You're just left dumbfound. You know the ayat about uh, shaitan? What, he will, what directions he will attack from? And you would know, even if you don't know the Arabic, what directions will he attack from? From the front? From behind? From the right and the left. Okay? Now, the thing is, Move, move, I gotta finish this talk because this is too interesting. Have a seat, everybody. So, shaitan attacks from how many directions? The devil attacks from how many, how many directions? Four. From in front, min bayni aydihim. Min bayni aydihim. From behind, min khalfihim. But then, an, not min, he changes the preposition. Now, the, in the English language, it says from in front, from behind, from the right, from the left. But the kind of from used when the right and the left are mentioned is changed. The kind of from used in the Arabic for the front and the back is the same, and the right and the left has been altered. It's an, it's not min. Which again, in translation, would come across as from. It, you wouldn't notice a difference. Except an, the, the, linguistically, il, alludes to further distance. It alludes to more distance. Min is actually... Immediate, mubashir, it's immediate, direct, and an is more distant. On the right and the left, there are angels of us. Yes? And he has to get through them. So there's a little bit more of a distance. Of the many explanations of the an in the ayah, just down to the prepositions. Personally, I am fascinated by this stuff. I, I am mind blown by this stuff. But I will not go out and say, here's the reason why the Quran is a miracle. I will say, here is why, here is what impacts me from the miracles of the Qur'an. Here's what makes the Qur'an beautiful to me, overwhelming to me, and I'd, like, I'd like to share some of that with you. I'm not interested in a debate. And that's the last thing here. I know when Muslims think believers, atheists, then it's in your mind you see a, like a boxing ring. You know, in a showdown. <laughs> it's not a showdown, it's not a match. Debate is the, probably the worst kind of exercise you can do when it comes to this, this issue. Debating is, is kind of like a fight. Nobody goes into a match ready to lose. You don't go into a match ready to lose. You go into a match to take the other one out. And if they tell you something that stumps you, meaning you prepared your arguments and the other came with arguments and it seems like they overwhelmed your arguments, it's not like you're gonna say, oh, you win. I'm a believer now, or you win, I'm an atheist now. No, no, no. I'm going to go back to the drawing board, and I'm going to come up with a way to punch you right back. In other words, the attitude in a debate is not one of accepting the other. It is one of crushing the other. Right? So if you're already getting into a debate, that no, you're not heading down a productive road. You're just not heading down a productive road. We can have discussion. We can have an exchange of ideas. But you should have the common sense to know when it's turning into a debate and stop yourself. Because it's just not productive. It doesn't bring any good. It doesn't have any good. May Allah Azza wa Jal help us understand this topic and its roots. And I pray that those, the, the youth among us that are, that are kind of taken in sometimes by these kinds of arguments, it's not just our faith, by the way. Just, Islam is the easy target nowadays as far as you know, being criticized. But people, young people across faiths are actually losing faith. And that is not just a, their, that's their problem. I'm worried about the Muslim kids. Actually, that's a universal problem. Because Islam, 
if you look at the Quran, it actually called people that already had some kind of faith, which Islam considered in need of adjustment, in need of refinement. And then it purified it. Even the mushrik had a kind of faith, didn't he? He had some kind of faith, it just needed to be cleansed. It just needed tazkiyah. So even for, for, to, to have that premise to work with, that baseline to work with, that is the, where the, the invitation of Islam begins. So it is a problem across the board that people are losing faith, not just Muslims. And it is something that we have to try and address from its intellectual roots, from its social roots, from its psychological roots. Thank you very much. As-salamu alaykum wa